All right. So, hello, everyone. Welcome to another pre law shot hour session. My name is Christiane, and I'm here. I'm joined with um, Ashley, and I'm so excited for her to be here. Ashley, thank you so much once again for being here, taking the time out of your very busy schedule to come and talk to us um, and provide all your advice. Um, and just to introduce myself, my name is Christiane. Once again, I'm a fourth year student at the University of Toronto, so I'm graduating very soon. Um, I'm doing a double major, no, a major in political science and a double minor in public law and international development studies. Um, almost forgot what I'm studying. And uh, I do have aspirations of going to law school very soon um, and hopefully becoming a lawyer. So I'm very excited um, to talk to you, Ashley. And without further ado, I will pass the microphone on to you to introduce yourself. Ah, uh, well, what is there to say about me? I mean, I guess you guys probably want to know the legal part of my life. Um, so yeah, my name's Ashley. I practice in family law, estate litigation, and civil litigation, although I'm trying to move my practice over to, to just family law and estate litigation because I, I find it more interesting than civil litigation. No offense, civil litigators. Um, I have not been a lawyer for very long. I was called to the Bar of Ontario in June 2022nd. Not that long ago, but I'm already having trouble remembering. Um, right now, I, I am working at a small law firm called KMH Lawyers in Ottawa. Um, and yeah, so far, so good. I'm, I'm loving it. <laughs> I'm glad I became a lawyer. You guys got me on a good day. I just got back from vacation, so <laughs> I'm feeling good. Oh, that's so cool. Where'd you go? Go if you don't mind me asking. I, I actually took the train from Toronto to Vancouver. Okay. Um, through Via Rail. It's called the Canadian trip or, or whatever. I've heard I, of it. I like trains and they were offering it 50% off. So I also like good deals. <laughs> Can't go wrong. As but, we all. Uh, no, it's very nice. Not that this is supposed to be an advertisement, but I do recommend the Canadian. It was great. Mo you know, met lots of nice people, a lot of people from the US too, mm -hmm. um, and lots of good food. I also learned that in Vancouver, they don't know what snow is. Because I remember trying to get back. It, I, yeah, I remember our flight was delayed because of severe weather conditions. And I yes. looked outside and I'm like, it is barely snowing. <laughs> I know. I know every time because I'm in, well, I'm in Whippy. It's an hour away from Toronto. But every time we get like a severe weather alert or something, all like the buses will cancel. And, you know, it's, everyone will start panicking. I'm like, where like, it's just a little snowfall like we're Canadians <laughs> yeah apparently some Canadians don't know what snow is <laughs> for sure oh I know we learn something new every day <laughs> <laughs> all right well thank you so much for introducing yourself and so my first question for you is at what point in your life did you decide that you wanted to pursue a legal career like what what is that motivation uh that led you toward you know the legal profession is it someone that you know um that inspires you a kind of moment in your life where you're like mm, I want to be a lawyer well it was funny for me it was one of those things where I've wanted to be a lawyer since I was a little kid and I, I wanted to be a family lawyer since I was young actually because unfortunately, I, I've had experience in the family law system from a young age with my own family. And I, I don't know, I do think families are foundational to society, foundational to people. I knew it was something that would be very important to me every day. And I don't know, I guess the cheesy part of it is I wanted to help families like mine. And it, so since I was a kid, I wanted to be a lawyer. Also throughout my life, you know, teachers and whatnot would tell me, oh, you should be a lawyer because you like to argue so much, <laughs> which I've actually discovered is not necessarily a good quality for a lawyer. Um, <laughs> but I, yeah, I did have the personal experience that motivated me. Um, and for actually for a while, when I took my undergrad in criminology, which has a lot to do with analyzing crime and, and the criminal law system, uh, I, I did want to be a criminal lawyer. Then I went to law school um, and I worked a bit in criminal law and decided, OK, I don't want to be a criminal law. Criminal law is not for me. So I went back to family law and actually um, during school at the University of Ottawa during law school, they do give you an opportunity to do um, what they call student proposed internships. So you can propose to the school that you want to do a work internship uh, with a specific lawyer. So again, you, you don't get paid for this work, but it is hands-on experience. And that's one of the things that I really liked about U Ottawa. I'm not sure if other law schools have that kind of opportunity, 
Um, but if they do, it's definitely something you should take advantage of. Um, Cause yeah, I, I remember in my undergrad trying to get work experience in criminology was not very easy. So I liked that in law school, you could make your own experience. And actually I, I did do a student proposed internship with a family lawyer who was actually my mom's family lawyer when I was a kid. <laughs> so it was kind of nice to go full circle. <laughs> Wow, that's actually, that's really cool. And thank you so much for sharing your experience and your motivation. Um, I definitely relate, you know, to you in the sense that I, I, I kind of always knew I wanted to be a lawyer ever since I was younger too. Teachers did tell me, and I, I tell this story every time on here, but I wrote in grade four, a very persuasive paper on why my family should get a dog. And apparently it was a really good paper. And so <laughs> I still don't have a dog, but no. I know all that for nothing. But my teacher did read it and she's like, oh, you know, you should be a lawyer. And, and I didn't know what that meant at, at grade four. So I, I, I went home, I did slowly started doing a little bit of research in high school. I took a whole bunch of law classes. And like you, I think I wanted to be a, a, a criminal lawyer first. Like, you know, that, that was the way that I wanted to go just because I found it really fascinating. Uh, people always said that's where a lot of money is. And, you know, um, I, I just thought it was, it was a really cool, really cool thing. But the more I think about it, I'm like, Oh, I don't know if that's for me. I think it's a little too, might be a little too intense. Um, so I am kind of trying to explore what, what I think I might like. And I know a lot of people don't even know what they want to do until they get to law school, but family law has been something that's been in the back of my mind. Um, so I'm always excited when family lawyers are, when I get to talk to family lawyers on here. Um, so yeah. I, I can tell you that uh, criminal law, I don't think, I don't know if there's money in that, at least not where I worked. <laughs> I remember thinking like, man, my mentor works way too hard and I just doubt he's getting paid enough. Because really? yeah, like, yeah. criminal law, at least for defense, I mean, or, or at least with the lawyers that I worked with, um, well, yeah, they weren't the lawyers who would do, you know, the case that's all over the news or anything like that. It's, mm -hmm. it's much smaller incidents. For sure. And yeah, I just remember phone calls at every hour of the night is just, it's not for me. Yeah, no, that's another, and I think there's the cases that, that criminal lawyers deal with just isn't something, like, as much as I want to help those people, it's not something that I would personally, I feel, be able to do to the best of my ability. Um, so you said you graduated from, so you did your undergrad and you did law school at the University of Ottawa? Yes, I guess uh, another important thing about me is I was born and raised in Ottawa. Yeah. I love Ottawa. I haven't gone very far. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I I really love the University of Ottawa. Mm -hmm. No, I do have a I do have a couple friends there. I was born and raised in Whitby. <laughs> haven't been, but I love going to Ottawa. My family goes up there all the time in the summer, and then we keep going to Montreal and Quebec. But um, yeah, I, I have a few friends there and then they love the University of Ottawa. And I know a lot of people um, say that it's great to 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 be in Ottawa, um, you know, and study in Ottawa because that's the capital of Canada and the parliament's right there. So I, it's really cool. Um, and I was wondering, so you said you did criminology. Um, what did, did you take any courses that you think might have benefited you in law school? Yeah, so I did my undergrad in criminology at U Ottawa. I also did a minor in law, mm -hmm. and that was nice. It gave me some foundational information, but I don't know. It wasn't all that helpful. I found criminology to be much more helpful. I think something that would really help you with law school is just honestly not so much the substantive knowledge as much as, much as it is about critical thinking or engaging with material on a deeper deeper level. So I think criminology at UOttawa, like we have some really amazing professors who, in my opinion, they'll guide you into, okay, how can I engage with this on a deeper level? Like, what does it mean? And also, what is it not saying? And what does that mean? And that is very important for law school. When you go to law school, when you do an exam, the professors don't just want you to regurgitate what they've told you. They don't want you to regurgitate what's written in the textbook or written online, because now you can Google all the acts. <laughs> they want to know like how, what does it actually mean to you? How are you engaging with this critically? How are you actually going to apply this and analyze it in a real life situation? 
I don't know if that answers your question. No, no, for sure. It definitely does. And I think that's very beneficial because I did hear that in law school, it's very much analytical. Like you mm -hmm. said, you're not just kind of regurgitating all the information you learn. You're kind of really working with it, getting at the bottom of it um, and providing a critical analysis of it. Um, and I know there, I mean, I've, I've always heard that philosophy, for example, is really good to take for logical thinking when it comes to the LSAT. And speaking about the LSAT, I think it's a good segue. Um, how was the LSAT for you? And how was the law school admission process like for you? That was fun. Um, my advice is that it's going to take much longer than you anticipated. And you should not wait until the last week to do it. For the LSAT, um, oh, the LSAT. I highly recommend studying for the LSAT in advance. If I could go back, I would have liked to have given myself a year. And, you know, that's not a year of hardcore studying every day or every week necessarily. I just found that when it came to, you know, the logical reasoning questions, it helped a lot the more time I had to sit with them to kind of understand. Because, um, yeah, I think in the end, I only... I think I only studied for a few months, a couple months. It wasn't very long. I, I remember the day before the LSAT, I was like sitting down, studying, panicking. <laughs> um, and I, I actually did end up taking a course because I, I didn't know anyone who was applying for law school and I didn't know, really know any lawyers that I could talk to about it. So I didn't really know what to expect for the LSAT. I just know that at first it felt like the tests were in another language. And I just knew that there was some kind of way to study for it that I just didn't know about. So yeah, I took a, a course, I paid for it. I, I was actually trying to figure out what course I had taken so that I could say, but I, I don't remember and I, I couldn't figure it out. All I know is that it wasn't the most expensive course because you know I, I was a student, I didn't have money for that. Um, and it was a course where you could take it a second time for free too. So I remember I took it like a month or so before the LSAT. And then like a week before the LSAT, I took it again to kind of refresh my memory. Um, and yeah, like once, once you understand the reasoning behind the LSAT and just how the questions work, how the logic games work and really what they're looking for, then it, it makes it so much easier. Cause it, especially for the, I think it was called the logical reasoning section where they give you a little blurb, like a hypothetical scenario. And then there were multiple choice answers. And all the answers were fine, but one of them was slightly better. Like they all have the same kind of formula behind them. So it, it really helped to have somebody teach me what that was. So if you can't afford a course, I'm pretty sure that there are books online too that you can buy to read. Or even just, you know, if you know anybody who's already gone to law school or just done the LSAT, then you can ask them for their pre practice exams. Because yeah, I. I bought some practice tests, those were helpful. I know I, I had some friends who studied for the LSAT every day. Like one day they would do a practice exam timed and the next day they would go through and check their answers, figure out what they did wrong, why. I didn't, I honestly didn't really leave myself enough time for that. Um, but yeah, definitely do a few practice tests. I think I started off with just doing the tests. I didn't time myself. Um, and then I started doing the time test and I never liked my results. <laughs> my results were always very scary. Um, and honestly, it is a very stressful time, I think, for everybody trying to do the LSAT. And yeah, I, I remember I didn't, oh yeah, if you're signing up for the LSAT too, the location, sign up in advance, like as soon as they open. Um, I guess like some locations are busier than others, like probably Toronto and Ottawa. But yeah, I remember trying to sign up for Ottawa and it had only been like two days that the signup was open and it was fully booked. And I didn't wanna take it any later because um, I also heard that when they're doing the law school admission process, they do it in waves. Um, so if you're in the first wave, you have a higher chance of becoming accepted because in the second and the third wave, they have less availability. So I wanted to do the LSAT right away and I wanted to get my application in like the minute that it opened, which I think, I think that was like sometime in October or November, I don't remember. Um, oh yeah, so I, I wanted to do the LSAT at the right date, couldn't do it in Ottawa, so then I had to arrange to do it in Cornwall, which I guess really isn't that far, <laughs> but driving there in the morning I got stuck behind um, a, a street painter that was so slow, so yeah, my LSAT day, I was stressed, like you wouldn't believe, um, but yeah, it's, it's just do the practice tests, 
once you get in there, like, you know what you know, and it's just about relaxing and doing the best that you can. I have friends who had to take the LSAT multiple times to get into law school. Um, if you're applying for a university like the Toronto University for law school, they expect a higher LSAT grade than U Ottawa does. Um, I, I only applied to U Ottawa, so I wasn't too worried about it. And I think in the end, I still had a pretty good grade. Um, but yeah, it's the LSAT is curved, I'm, I'm pretty sure. So if you study and you just do the work, then you're already a, ahead <laughs> of most people doing the LSAT. Because a lot of people, they just write it and then you know they do horribly. <laughs> they think that they can wing it. And yeah, you don't have to like study substantive knowledge or anything, but it's, yeah. it's good just to practice the logic. It's not <laughs> always common sense. <laughs> For sure. That like boggles my mind how some people can just say, I'm going to write the LSAT, but I'm not going to study like this is just going to be fine. Um, but I think uh, what, what you said about practice tests, a lawyer one time told me, or I don't even know if it was a lawyer or a teacher, but they said that before you actually sit down and, and start studying for the LSAT before, like just just take a test just to kind of see where you are and then what you need to improve to get, you know, mm -hmm. the, that, like the good mark. Um, so yeah, I, I'm thinking of studying for it. I, 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 I'm hoping to do it sometime in the summer right now. It's really, really hard for me to start studying for it because, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, like I said, I'm in fourth year and I'm taking on a full course load. So I'm waiting until school is done and that's, you know, that's over. And then I can kind of hunker down and start studying. But did you go to law school like right after you graduated undergrad or or did you take a gap year like how did, where did where'd that go I went straight to law school mm -hmm. yeah most of my law school friends did do the gap year so they had yeah they had more time to study for the LSAT I guess like I it's not that I was procrastinating but again I was in my last year of university I still wanted to you know get really high grades to keep my application um, competitive or whatever it was very hard to find time to sit down and study for the LSAT Mm -hmm. um, and, and yeah, when you do the test, you'll see what you need to improve on. Yes. Um, like at, at first I was really bad at the, like the logic math games, but then, you know, when I worked on it and I improved on it, it became my best, <laughs> my best one. I was like, if I can get a hundred percent on the logic games, then maybe I can do this. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, and then, so because you went right after, does that mean that you took the LSAT during third year before your fourth year, I would assume? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, you're right. I was in my third year when I was studying it. And I, yeah, I wrote it in the summer. Mm -hmm. I think the early summer of my third year. Yeah, I think I just finished. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because I think what you can do is you can apply to law school in the fall and then write the LSAT the following winter. And I wouldn't recommend doing that mm -hmm. just because I, I heard that they do do it in waves. Yeah. So I wanted my application to be ready to go so that it'd be one of the first ones that they would review. And I and then I heard back very quickly, too. Yeah. Yeah. And I was talking to my friend about that as well, because, you know, I was stressing out. I'm like, well, well I want to apply this October. But like, what if I like what if I don't because I'm also planning on going away in the summer for a month. It's a big like family vacation that we're mm -hmm. doing going back home. So I was like, I don't know when I'm going to write it. What if I had, don't have time? So she recommended that I I just write it and then see what happens. And then at least I have like a score that I can submit in October when I apply to law school. And then if it apparently like if I don't do well, I can rewrite it again in January or November, whenever the winter uh, LSAT is, and then kind of resubmit that. But at least you have something for like, like you said, the first wave. So yes, there are kind of waves that are that. Yeah. That's like that. Yeah. So it's good advice. Um, and then, so you, so yes, you graduated from the University of Ottawa Law School as well. How was your law school experience? It's a very oh, broad question, but like. <laughs> yeah. Um, my first year was kind of hit or miss. Yeah. I, I think I, this probably doesn't sound great, but I think I actually stopped going to class for a few days because I was like, I'm just going to quit. <laughs> I think, yeah, that was before I got my midterms back. Because I just felt like I, I didn't understand it. I felt like everybody else understood it and I just wasn't getting it. 
So I was just going to quit. And then I got my midterm marks back and they were actually really good. So I think, or maybe I just was a victim of imposter syndrome, but I, I think there is a lot of imposter syndrome going around at law school. And I don't know, there are a lot of people who, if you believe them, it's just like, oh, everyone's getting straight A's. Everyone's having a great time. You're the only one who doesn't get this, um, but you're not alone. And I have a lot of friends who went through law school with C's and D's and now they're lawyers and everything's fine and they're amazing lawyers and I recommend people to them all the time. And I, I did hear one professor say that the students who get D's and C's, they go on to be trial lawyers, blah, blah, blah. The students who get B's, they become academics. The students who get A's, they become judges. All that is to say that your grades don't really matter once you get into law school. And like I, I had friends who were super, super smart. They got straight A's through their undergrad. Then they got to law school and they were just a straight C student. It really is measuring a certain kind of intelligence or, or thing on an exam. Um, but it's, it's really about what you make of it. It's not, it's not about your grades. You're not defined by your grades. You can go through law school, make the most of the experience, absorb everything you possibly can in every class. And yeah, everything will be fine. Um, make good friends, good quality friends. They're the ones that you can lean on when you think, oh, I should just drop out of school. I'm clearly not good enough. They'll talk you down. They'll convince you to go back. <laughs> um, and yeah, and I think there are a lot of professors, I guess that I can only speak for you, Ottawa, that really care about your learning experience. And they're happy to talk with you after class. I even have professors that I still talk to, they still care. Um, yeah, and I, overall, I think I had a, a very good law school experience. Um, if you want, I can talk about courses that I recommend. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so in law school, I took one course, um, I think it's called International Peace Mediation. It's with John Packer mm -hmm. and that, that is a very good course. It's not just teaching you the substantive area of law. Um, and honestly, once you get out of law school, it's great if you know the substantive area, but I've, I found that doesn't really get you that far. It's about analyzing and understanding the root causes. Um, I didn't actually go into international law and it is international peace mediation. So it has an international law element, mm -hmm. but a lot of it was just about, okay, how do you identify the root problem and how do you come up with creative solutions that everybody can live with. And honestly, that is my day to day. Just how, how can I identify your issue? How can I address your issue? And how can everyone just move on with their lives? Mm -hmm. So courses like that, um, I regret not taking mediation and negotiation. Because again, a case is mostly how can you mediate? How can you negotiate? It, it is actually very rare for a case to go all the way to trial. Um, I have a few cases where it kind of looks like that's where they're going, but honestly, my job is just, okay, how can I get, you know, a good settlement for my client? Um, so those are the important classes. Mm -hmm. classes. And I guess just, just take courses that you really enjoy. Like it's, if you spend a week in a course and, and you're just, you're not enjoying it for whatever reason, you and your professor just aren't on the same wavelength, I would just get out, get out, go to yeah. a different class. It's, it's just worth it. If, if you have a professor <laughs> that you can connect with, you'll learn more and you'll just be happier. For sure. And I mean, I've learned that in undergrad too. I've, I've, <laughs> I've had a few courses where obviously the ones that are required for my major or minor, I'd have to stay in, but there's a few courses where you know, I just, I didn't connect with the professor. And then, you know, I looked at the syllabus and I'm like, Maybe not. And I've, I've dropped out of them. So I, I think the same definitely applies to law school. And I also, when you're talking about your law school experience, I also appreciated how you mentioned imposter syndrome, because I know a lot of lawyers that the ones that at least I have talked to and even, you know, undergrad students, it's a lot of people feel imposter syndrome as if they don't, you know, belong there and everyone else is kind of better than them. So how did you, how did you overcome that? I was very lucky that I had good friends mm -hmm. um, who were kind of dealing with the same thing and just friends that I could trust to be honest with me. But there is there's a variety of different students that go to law school. So you can kind of 
find who you want to connect with. There are a lot of study groups in law school because people recognize that it helps. Mm -hmm. So I, I did find that most of the students are there to help each other and just to be good friends. Like I've met some of my best friends in law school. Yeah. Um, U Ottawa, I think that they have a lot of good services. Um, like I, I forget her name and what her actual job title is. But like when I was thinking of quitting, there was somebody at the common law office that I could go and I could talk to. And she was very helpful. I had, I experienced a, a pretty bad family situation during law school and I was just feeling so overwhelmed. And yeah, they had a lot of services. So I didn't, I didn't feel alone and it actually felt like the faculty was helping me go on. Um, so yeah, talk, talk to people. <laughs> Don't feel like an imposter on your own. And first of all, you're not the only person that feels like an imposter. Second of all, you're not an imposter. It's, it's not true. Yeah. If you, I mean, if you made it to university and, and you got an undergrad, you're smart. You're smart enough. <laughs> don't don't worry about it. I mean, going to law school itself is such an accomplishment. Um, <laughs> doing the like completing the LSAT, it seems like is, a, is such an accomplishment in itself. Let alone you know going to law school and doing the work. But I think yeah, like 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 you said, establishing that support system that I mean will clearly be beneficial to you after law school as well is all is, is very very important. Yeah. Yeah, because the imposter syndrome doesn't really go away. I still have days where I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm in over my head. What am I doing? And it, <laughs> it's just really helpful to have people that you can connect with. Um, and, and again, if you don't have any close friends, or it's always nice to, to reach out to mental health services too. And I, I do think that U Ottawa has a lot of that. Yeah, for sure. Utilize those services. I mean, that's what that's what we're paying for. So, you know, yes. make, make the use of it for sure. Um, so... Now, a little bit more into your field. Like you said, I know you practice family law, civil and estate litigation, but hopefully family and estate, that's what you're saying. And this is probably one of my favorite questions to ask lawyers that come on here. Um, you know, what do you like most about the field that you're studying or the field that you're working in? And what, if anything, do you dislike the most about this field? <laughs> Well, what I like the most is actually kind of what I dislike the most too. Um, I, I love the people. I love family law and estate litigation because you tend to mostly be dealing with families. And I don't know, families, I think, go to like the root of our society and the root of who we are. So it's very important to people. And when people call up and they're looking for a family lawyer or an estate litigator, you know, they're not having a great time generally. So I, I just like being able to talk to people. I like being able to listen to their stories. I like being able to do what I can. You know, I'm, I'm not a magic worker here. So there are some problems that I just can't fix or I can't help with. There's no legal aspect to it. Um, but that's something that I like. I like talking to people. Um, on the flip side of the coin, it's also very emotionally draining to be dealing with other people who have, you know, these very serious and, and traumatic and unfortunate situations. Um, and honestly, sometimes the law just isn't the answer. Like the law, in my personal opinion, isn't very well equipped to deal with families and to deal with these personal problems. Because you're taking something that is just so personable in nature and you're levying it against a legal system that is anything but personal. It's just a, a big blanket system that you try to apply to every case. And, you know, obviously every family is unique. So something that's very important in family law and also in estate litigation, because um, when I did my articling, it was in estate litigation and civil litigation and actually had nothing to do with family law, which I was disappointed in. But then I found out that estate litigation is a lot like family law. It tends to be families um, and, you know, dealing with families, there's always a, an extra sensitive touch that you have to use. Um, so some people may not enjoy that. If, if you're not a people person, then maybe you don't want to do family law. Um, but I think the most important thing in family law and honestly, and probably in law altogether is creating some distance between you and your cases. Like when I walk into the office, my life is about my clients. I care about my clients. I truly care. I want them to know that I care and I want them to know that I'm doing everything I can, you know, within my power to help them. When I leave the office and I'm not very good at this, but I imagine that one day I will be able to come home walk through the door and okay, my life is all about my family. I don't even know who my clients are. I don't care what's happening in their life. 
because this is my life now. It's very, very hard to do that. And I think that's where a lot of lawyers experience burnout. Like I just went on vacation. I really, really needed it because I'm dealing with some tough cases emotionally. Um, but yeah, that, that is probably my best advice. <laughs> Understand that there's a difference between your client's problems and your problems. There's a difference between your work life and your family life. And you can't survive if you don't find that work-life balance because, or at least for me, being a lawyer isn't part of my identity or I don't want it to be. I want it to be work and I want my life to be about other things. I, I want to just be Ashley sometimes. <laughs> So yeah, <laughs> for sure. I think that's no, I think that's great advice. And I hear it a lot, um, especially people who do criminal law and family law. A lot of the times they tend to bring their cases home to the dinner table. Um, and it's hard because I've I've met lawyers who who have who have families who have kids and they'll take out all the emotion that they have on their children. And it's mm -hmm. it's it's not easy whatsoever. And and I I applaud you. <laughs> For, for trying to work through that. For I sure. do my best because mm -hmm. I just ask, is my career worth my personal relationships? Oh, for not. sure. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I have a feeling that there's the type of person that I will be just because I am, if, if you're a type of person that's so dedicated to your work, you start to kind of have an attachment to it. And I mm -hmm. kind of am like that when it comes to, for example, it's obviously a lot smaller than the cases that you deal with, but like schoolwork, you know, I'm so like dedicated and I'm, you know, it comes with sort of being a perfectionist. I prioritize my schoolwork sometimes over my personal relationships or just going out and enjoying time with family and so that kind of worries me it's like okay if I want to be a lawyer I don't want to do that I, I don't want to do that I want my life to be much more than the cases that I'm that I'm working on um, so that's definitely some really good advice and I feel like when I get to that point hopefully um, I'm going to have to grapple with that and try to work my way around that for sure <laughs> It it takes a lot of work and a lot of energy to not focus on work. Mm -hmm. It really does. I mean, for sure. people like me, because I I think maybe I care too much about mm -hmm. my clients and too much about my cases. And, <laughs> well, yeah, because the, the work-life balance, the way that I'm trying to see it now is that I, I do it for my clients. If yeah. I can't come home and re-energize or rest, then I'm for really sure. not doing them any favors. I'm not going to be at my best. Exactly. And you honestly, like you do have some clients that, you know, obviously they think that their problems are very important and they are very important to them. It can, to a lot of clients, when you're dealing with your family in the legal system, it can feel like it's a life or death situation. Mm -hmm. And I totally get that. Um, but some clients really do want to take all your time and energy. Like some clients will call you after hours. Some clients will try to set up meetings with me on the weekend some clients will get very upset that I'm taking a few days off and I'm not going to respond to their emails during that time and I just like you have to set boundaries with clients it's very important mm -hmm. so I, I tell clients when they're hiring me like after 5 p.m I I don't check my emails sometimes I do <laughs> but I, I tell them that I'm not going to and I tell yeah. them I'm not going to meet with you on the weekend I'm sorry I can't but, like I do have other cases and I do have other things to do with my time for sure I find like if there are some clients that I find very emotionally draining, then I'll schedule my phone calls with them to be towards the end of the day, just so it doesn't zap my energy at the beginning. And it's, beginning. you can do things like that to, to set boundaries. Sometimes you do have to fire a client if they're really becoming too much for your mental health, or you really find that you can't work with them. Like I, I have had clients like scream at me over the phone and, you know, I tell them like, okay, that's not, that's not acceptable. You know, unfortunately I, I can't, I can't accept that and I can't work with that. And you know, if it doesn't work out, then you fire them. And I'm lucky enough to work at a at a small firm or have a good relationship with my boss and she's very understanding. Cause I know with you know bigger firms, they'll give you a client and you're not allowed to get rid of the client. So I, I like being able to fire a client when need be. Mm -hmm. Because the other thing is, you know, if they're screaming at you and they don't listen, then you can't really help them anyways. For sure. It just, it doesn't, it doesn't work. And I do, I, I do like what you say about the fact that, you know, um, taking time for yourself is actually doing a favor for your clients, um, which, which is really good to think about. Um, 
And in terms of my question, I wanted to know kind of how do you balance the workload with personal life? What do you like to do in, in your free time? <laughs> oh, free time. So yeah, I, I'm trying, <laughs> trying very hard. I used to, I mean, especially during articling, I used to work really long hours and late hours because I wanted to show my boss like, oh, I'm, I'm committed, I can work hard. And then I just burned out how many months into articling was that? I just burned out and I told my boss, I, I need a break. I can't, I can't actually do this anymore. <laughs> um, so I'm, and then as a lawyer, I'm like, oh, there's even more work than being an articling student. Great. Not, not to scare articling students out there. Uh, you do become a lot faster at the work and it, it becomes easier when you identify a problem. You're like, oh, I've seen this before. Anyways, I'm getting a little off topic. And maybe that's because I don't really have an answer. Um, I, I find it very difficult to balance work and life. I'm trying to work shorter hours. I'm trying to go home and, and do the thing where I walk in and I don't know who my clients are and I'm only Ashley and Ashley's not a lawyer. Ashley doesn't know anything about the law so she needs to ignore the law. Um, I find that if you can, scheduling dates with my friends after work hours will make me more committed to, okay, I need to work and I need to leave at this time so I can go do something for myself. Exercising is so important. Exercising will make you feel better, hopefully. So I'm trying to, trying to exercise more, um, trying to think of it as like, okay, exercise and make, you know, taking the time to pack a healthy lunch, that's priority one. Priority two is work. So mm -hmm. health, then work. You know, once I've checked all the health boxes, then I have the time to do work as opposed to, okay, once I've finished my work, then I'll work out. It's like, then, then the exercise, it just never happens because there's always more work. Mm -hmm. So it, for me, it's kind of a, a mind change or changing okay. my mindset. Another way to look at it is, okay, I'm doing my clients a favor if I'm re-energizing, re-energizing, things like that. Um, but yeah, I, I like going for, for runs. Like sometimes I get home. I take my dog out and I just, I have to run it off. Um, yeah, having a dog is nice, but honestly, if I didn't have somebody babysit my dog, I probably wouldn't be able to have a dog because I just, I work too late, mm -hmm. <laughs> too late for my dog to be at home all alone. So I'm, I'm lucky that I have a, a babysitter for her. Yeah. Um, what else, what else do I do in my free, free time? I guess I'm not that interesting. Um, <laughs> I like rock climbing. <laughs> that's so cool. I like rock climbing. <laughs> no, that's great. I mean, like, I'm hoping I get, first of all, dogs can be great therapy. They're great to have. I, I still don't have a dog, even though my persuasive essay about a dog is the reason why I wanted to be a lawyer. Just kind of, anyway. Um, but I'm, I get worried though, because I, I'm, a person who wants to have a family in the future. I want to get married and have kids. And I know I've talked to a few lawyers that say that, you know, it's not impossible, obviously, because tons of lawyers, you know, are married and have children, but it is difficult to balance that. And so that's something that I'm always personally worried about when it comes to balancing, you know, personal life with work. Um, yeah, well, we'll have to figure that one out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's also very important, the law firm or the job that you choose for yourself. Mm -hmm. Like I, I was very, very picky when I was looking for a job as a lawyer. Yeah. I was offered a job at the firm that I articled with, KMH Lawyers, where I work now. But I, I, I did want to shop around a bit or I ended up shopping around a bit. Mm -hmm. And what I really like about my law firm is how flexible the hours are. Like I, and I have a boss that I can be honest and upfront with, and, you know, I, I really like my bosses, both of them. Um, mm -hmm. But true. what I like about a smaller firm is you do get a little more flexibility. Like I, if I have a family emergency and I, I don't have any court cases or anything urgent, I can leave the office at noon. My boss isn't going to go to my office and be like, where the heck is she? She's not going to send me like a dozen angry emails. She trusts that I'm a professional you know, the work will get done later or whatever. Mm -hmm. I know that there are a lot of law firms, particularly big name law firms where, you know, they own your time. You're yeah. not allowed to leave before 6 p.m. It doesn't matter how early you got in. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's important to be very picky. Like I, I mean, the other thing is, you know, when you finish articling and, and you have all the student debt, 
you're, you're pretty scared. You're pretty motivated just to take any job that comes along. And I, I had friends who did that. And unfortunately it didn't work out because they just weren't a good match with their law firm. So I, I would recommend shopping around for a law firm. I think like when you're in a job interview in law, it's kind of scary to ask the interview. Okay. Well, like, what's your work-life balance like, you know? Yeah. Yes. In a lot of ways you're interviewing the firm and, and you're picking the firm. Mm-hmm. So I had interviews with firms where I was like, okay, I, you know, it's not the work-life balance for me. And then my firm, which is, you know, smaller, a lot nicer. My boss trusts me to be a professional. If I just want to work from home one day, I can. Mm-hmm. And I don't have to worry about angry emails and phone calls and <laughs> my boss questioning questioning how committed I am to the work. Yeah, no, I think it's I think it's super important to to find a firm that works for you and your life and your needs, which is good that, that that's what you did. Every, every, you know, there's a lot of my friends I talk to, like, oh, I want to be a Bay Street lawyer. And I'm like, oh, do you? Hi, you're never going to see them again. <laughs> well, exactly. I'm like, oh, I don't know about that. I don't need that. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I, I remember in law school too, there was a like everybody wanted to work for the big name law firms. Everyone wanted to work on Bay Street or, or just one of the big name law firms in Ottawa. Mm-hmm. And and yeah, I remember, cause I did end up getting pretty high grades in law school. Not that I still don't think grades matter. Um, well, except that grades will help get you an interview with big name law firms. So I got a lot of interviews with them and yeah, I interviewed them <laughs> instead of them interviewing me. And I found, okay, you know what? That's actually not for me. So now I need to change my plans. Yeah. So the other thing about, like law school and just law in general is, you know, remain flexible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Remain flexible, set those boundaries. Boundaries Um, are so important. mm -hmm. And I think really setting, like, you know, lawyers are probably always planning things, putting things in their calendar, you know, meetings with this client, a call with this person. But I think, you know, putting time in your calendar for yourself, because like spa day or like, you know, here I'm gonna this time I'm gonna go out with my friends we're gonna go out for lunch I think that's so important because I think we tend to just like overlook that and say you know what that's fine like it'll it'll happen later on in this week or like I'll have time to myself later on like it's okay I need to prioritize this call or I need to prioritize you know whatever um so I think like planning in for that too and putting personal time and time for yourself self-care in your schedule and in your agenda also kind of I guess, hold you accountable to it's like, okay, no, I need this time for myself. I have to, I have to rest. So, yeah. And I I hope that like the legal culture is opening up to that more because I I still feel guilty. Like, okay, if I leave at 5 p.m., it means I'm not working hard enough or I'm not working hard as all the other lawyers. So like, do I deserve to be here and, and just blah, blah, blah. And it's just, it's just a bad mentality. And I don't know if, you know, people who have that mentality are more likely to become lawyers or if it's like somehow we like, I don't know, entrench that into the lawyers that they mm-hmm. just need to work harder. And, and yeah, it's just, it's, you're going to get so burnt out. I, and, and yeah, like for me being a lawyer, isn't, it isn't everything. You know, if you go to law school, just remember that law school isn't everything. Mm-hmm. You have an identity that's separate from that. You have value and worth that's separate from that. For sure. Yeah. People. Yeah. I, I when I was younger, I was always like, oh, I'm going to be a lawyer and I'm going to have bragging rights. <laughs> and the person who marries me is going to have bragging rights. They're going to be like, I'm married to a lawyer. <laughs> but it's definitely not. It shouldn't be like your whole identity, like who you are. You are more than whatever career you go into. You're more than that job title, I think. Yeah. So you're right about the bragging rights. Like when I was on the train to, to Vancouver, and, you know, we were talking to people and they would ask, well, what do you do for a living? When you say lawyer, like people stop and they go, Ooh, yeah. you're a lawyer. Like it means something. It does. No, it does. And I mean, honestly, like it should in a way, because we, there's so much work that goes into it. We, you know, you go through hell and back, um, you know, so I, I think it, it's that the title should definitely be something that a lawyer is a hundred percent proud of and, and should, you know, I can't, I don't want to say like show off, but like show off, <laughs> but in terms of personal life and, you know, how you, for example, balance your work life and uh, with personal life and whatnot, it shouldn't be your whole identity that there is that other side of you that you, that you need to 
pay attention to as well. Um, so yeah, <laughs> that's what I think. And then if you can, if you can go back in time, so this yeah. we're kind of like nearing, nearing, nearing the end of our a little interview, but if you can go back in time before you even went to law school and you were able to talk to your younger self, that's that aspiring lawyer, what advice would you give that person? I love this question. <laughs> well, kind of like you were saying before, like be proud of yourself, be proud yeah. of the work that you've done so far. I mean, even even just applying to law school kind of felt like a, a bit of a battle. Yeah. So I, I like looking back every now and then and thinking, okay, this is how far I've come from like the little girl who wanted to get into family law because of her own bad experience with the legal system mm -hmm. to today where it's like, oh, I'm, I am actually a lawyer. Um, yeah. So yeah, so be proud of yourself. Give yourself credit for the work that you've done. Give yourself breaks because you deserve breaks. Everyone deserves breaks. And you know, just remember that your identity is fluid. So if you have everything set on going to law school and it doesn't work out, like that's fine. Just stay open to all the different opportunities. Like even if you go to law school and you think you want to do criminal law and then you think you want to do family law and then you think you want to do something else, like you don't actually know where you're going to end up. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people who go through law school and decide, oh, I, I don't actually want to be a lawyer. This isn't for me. There are a lot of people who become lawyers and they don't want to be lawyers anymore. Mm -hmm. um, really, so yeah, just keep keep yourself open. Don't be afraid of new experiences and, and don't be afraid of change. For I sure. know that's a lot easier said than done. A lot of people are are afraid of change, but in the long run, in the long run, it is a, a good thing. And it's really I mean, life is just a journey, as cheesy as that is. It's really not about the destination. <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 I love that. I love hearing that all the time. It's one of my favorite kind of quotes that people always say. And um, I like how you, how you said, just you know, kind of be open. I know there are so many people who go to law school and they're like, no, you know what? I don't want to be a lawyer. <laughs> and they end up doing something else. They have their law degree, but you know, it does still open a lot of doors for you. You don't necessarily mm -hmm. have to be a lawyer after law school. Um, and even if you're in law school and you think, you know what, I no, <laughs> that's fine too. I think not being afraid of change is is, is very important to to kind of keep in mind. So, so I mean, that's it. For me, um, does either Lydia or Riddy have any questions that that they want to ask before we go? You can put it in the chat or you can raise your hand. Oh yeah, I see that there's a question in the chat um, about looking for summer jobs. Yeah, experience is always nice to have. And like what I was saying earlier, what I liked about law school is that you could create your own experience because you could do a, a student proposed internship. Mm -hmm. um, when I was in undergrad in criminology, I actually didn't find a job that was related to my field, like a summer job related to my field. I don't know why it was so difficult, um, mm -hmm. but I, I just don't think that there's a lot available in terms of that. And then they always wanted a, a student with more experience. And how do you get more experience when you don't have experience? Um, so what I wish I had looked into more is volunteer experiences. If you can find like a not-for-profit organization that's in a related field, like the Elizabeth Fry Society for me in criminology, um, and just volunteer. And I know like the courthouse, they always look for volunteers too. It's just something to get yourself a, a bit closer and in a way to make your own experience. And then everybody likes to see volunteer experience on a resume. Like when I went to, to interviews with big name law firms, they loved asking me about my volunteer experience. And that's almost more interesting than like any paid work experience as well mm -hmm. so yeah it's not that's not great practical advice the answer is that i i don't really know but look for volunteer experience and, and i guess just try to make your own experience you know you can reach out to places like the elizabeth fry society and ask them if they're looking for anything um and and yeah i i know when I was in my undergrad, I had a difficult time just like reaching out to people and just sending them uh, like a point blank email about it. And a lot of emails go unanswered and a lot of emails, you know, they just get polite replies and they end up going nowhere. But sometimes it, it works out. And at the end of the day, you're at least making a connection with somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great advice. Perfect. 
Um, yeah, Lydia, go ahead. Thank you. Um, well, would you say there is a demand for lawyers or like in the family law field? That's a funny question. <laughs> um, right now, there's actually a huge demand for family lawyers. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not so sure about other lawyers, but yeah, I remember when I started articling, like the, the job market kind of went down for lawyers. Like there, there wasn't much out there. And then when I finished articling and I was looking for a job, it was suddenly everybody was looking for family lawyers in my call. Mm -hmm. Like I, apparently there aren't that many new family lawyers right now. And I, I really don't know why, because you'll find that family law is actually very, very popular in law school. Like they have their own little group that I actually never joined because I wasn't so sure about family law at the time anymore. Um, but yeah, right now, if you're a family lawyer, you can get a job easily. Um, and I, I, I think they're still looking for new calls. But yeah, it was kind of funny because I, there were so many law firms, like I actually had law firms reaching out to me <laughs> to try and catch me as a family lawyer. And yeah, I, I had this one experience. So not all lawyers are pleasant. I had applied for a job there and I did, I think three interviews at their insistence. And they sent me a job offer and an email. I asked them a few questions about it. I thought it over and I decided that I liked the people at the firm I was at more because I mean, you really want to, or some of my advice and some advice that I've heard is that it's worth taking a pay cut if you like the people that you work with. But anyways, ultimately I, I sent them a polite friendly email saying like, no, I, I can't accept your job. I've given it a lot of thought, you know, blah, blah, blah. It was so great to meet you. Hope we can stay in touch in the future, so on and so on. And he actually wrote me a very, very nasty email where he said that I will find the road to becoming a lawyer is especially bumpy in my case. And he's going to tell everyone not to trust me. And um, he said that he's a bencher of the law side of Ontario and, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. He, he basically threatened me. Um, and then a week later, he wrote a letter to my current boss telling her that, I, you know, I'm everything that is wrong with young lawyers in Ontario. Um, and that I had an employment contract with him that he spent, him and his staff spent a lot of time and money on me. And I, I breached the contract and he's going to sue them if he figures out they had anything to do with it. Like, it was awful. <laughs> um, well, oh, yeah. So I guess he must have been very upset not to get a family lawyer. <laughs> So it's a, it's a pretty good job market market for family lawyers right now. <laughs> okay, thank you. Do you um, this might sound silly, but what is art articling? Oh, I'm sorry. So law school is three years. And then after law school, you have to article. So you're basically um, a law student, but you're a law student for a lawyer. So you work at the firm. I think now they have to pay you. They didn't used to have to pay you. So I actually had friends who had to do it for free. And um, and yeah, so you have to do that for like eight to 10 months in Ontario, like different provinces have different requirements. I think in Quebec, you only have to article for six months. Um, but yeah, for me, it was 10 months. And I was basically a mini lawyer. Like a lot of it will depend again on the firm that you go to. I did a small firm, so I got to do everything. Like I, I had my own cases. So I was there from the client intake process to like the actual settlement of the case. Um, I have some friends who didn't have great articling experiences, like either their mentor overworked them or they were kind of put into a corner and they just did research for 10 months, which sucks. And, and you don't actually learn that much <laughs> just doing research. So yeah, so that's something to worry about during and after law school. Um, my recommend, my advice for that is to be picky. There's a lot of fear and like, okay, am I going to get an articling position? Because there are actually, like there's a higher demand for articling positions than there are positions. So some people don't get them. Um, so yeah, so there's an idea that like, okay, if you get offered a position, an articling position, you have to take it. I was more picky <laughs> and I, I found a law firm that I really liked and I, I had an amazing articling principle. So like when I was, you know, feeling drained, I was able to talk to her and say, okay, I, I need you to help, I don't know, reduce my workload or, or give me some time off, like work with me here so I can recover. Um, and, and that's very important to have. So it, just remember, like when you're doing job interviews, 
you're also interviewing the potential employer. You want to know, okay, is this somebody that I can work with? Is this somebody who's going to be fair and reasonable to me? But yeah, so it's, it's just eight to 10 months of working underneath a lawyer. And hopefully you have a lawyer who will let you take your own cases under supervision. Okay, thank you. But it's something you have to do before they'll give you your, your law license. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, um, I think that's it for today, Ashley. Once again, thank you so much for being here and talking about your career, giving such insightful advice, um, talking about your journey into the legal field. Like I said, it was all very insightful and pre-law shadowers is very grateful that you can give up some of your time to be here with us. Um, thank you, Rudy and Lydia, for coming to watch the session. Um, and uh, yeah, I had a great time. Thank you so much, Ashley. I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm also going to put my email address in the chat. Okay. So if anyone has any other questions or you just want to like talk to me about law school or how you're feeling, you can feel free to, to send me an email. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Well, good luck with everything. Um, what day is today? It's Tuesday. Have a great rest of your day. I was going to say have a great weekend. Not there yet. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> I know. Um, I was like, wait a second. Um, but good luck with everything. And thank you so much again, Ashley, for being here. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. Take care.